Hi, everyone. I'm Isaac Steinkamp, General Manager of the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers and writer for Chess Summit, the official sponsor of the Pittsburgh Pro Chess League team. And I'm going to go over the record and say it. Pittsburgh as a whole had a really terrible week when it came to sports. Uh, we started off the week on Sunday losing to the New England Patriots on the AFC Championship to nine with Steelers, a berth to another Super Bowl. So it was kind of rough to watch my least favorite NFL team do the job. And Later this week, my current university, University of Pittsburgh, the basketball team lost by over 50 points to the Louisville Cardinals. So when it came around to Wednesday night with our matchup with the Las Vegas Desert Rats, we were hoping to break that trend, but unfortunately we fell a lot short. Uh, we wound up losing the match 3.5 to 12.5. Not exactly the result that we wanted, but I think we learned a lot in terms of how this four-board setup works and what the overall strategies are in terms of scoring and whatnot. Um, you know, when I look at our average ratings compared to the Las Vegas average ratings, you know, I think, you know, a one to three score, you know, and a round, if it were just four rounds, uh, four, four games, that is, um, would be a very reasonable score. But unfortunately, you know, we're here to try to win games or get results and, uh, losing one to three in rounds isn't really helpful. And it, what actually happened was we, we, we lost the first round one to three. We lost the second round one to three. So by that point it was two to six. So even though in the third round, we only lost one and a half to two and a half. Um, we had already mathematically lost the match. Uh, the score was three and a half, eight and a half going into the last game. And unfortunately, we wound up dropping all four games in the last set. So not exactly an ideal finish for us. Um, definitely the toughest team I would say that we've played all season. But I think it says a lot about how momentum is important towards your overall team performance, especially if you're the lower rated team. Uh, I noticed in our match against San Francisco, it looked like it was going to be really bad. It started off 7 to nothing, and we were worried that you know we might not even get on the scoreboard at all. But then Grant scored a really important point to get us in the match, make it 7-1. to one. We actually made a slight comeback, and we actually made it possible for us to be able to tie up that matchup. Although that didn't really pan out, and we wound up losing 10-6. to six, That really helped us step up our game for Minnesota. And we actually won the first set in that match, which helped us stay competitive throughout the entire thing. And it wasn't clear until the fourth round who was going to win. So, unfortunately, we just didn't land that killer blow last night against Las Vegas. They fielded a really strong team of three GMs, and we just weren't able to kind of break through. You know, their top two boards got went 4-0 each, so congratulations to them. That's a really big achievement against this team, I think, based on how we've performed throughout the season. So, they played a really great game. I think, you know, you know they got the exact kind of matchup that they wanted, and, you know, kudos to them for doing, doing everything right. We've got a lot to learn from last night's matchup, and we're going to do everything that we can to close the gap, especially since we play Webster next week, which is probably one of the best teams in the Pro Chess League right now. Uh, I'm personally really excited about that match. We'll talk more about that later. But I wanted to talk about probably one of the nicer games that we had last night. We had three decisive games in our favor. Um, David Hua won a game. Grant Ju won a game. Alex Shabalov won a game. And Ed Song was able to draw a game you know, in the third round to keep it one and a half to two and a half. But unfortunately, by that point, it wasn't enough. So I thought it would be interesting to go over Alexander Shabalov's win because he had a really nice, instructive moment despite the score. So if we go to the position really quick, it looks like Black has a lot of space on the queen side. His pieces look like they could be a little bit more active. White's pieces look really passive. So I think on a first glance, someone playing white would be a little bit scared in terms of the overall assessment of the position. Maybe Black's better even. But Black just played this move F6, and his idea is to solidify the outpost on E5 um, and keep this really strong knight there. Unfortunately, what this does is it does create a hook for Shabalov to use. And even though he, you're, you're advised you know, early on not to move pawns in front of your king, that actually turned out to be the winning idea here. Shabalov immediately played g4. And after king h8, g5, everything blew open. So after fg5, bishop g5, h6, bishop came to f4. And now we see that there's a lot of weak light squares in front of the king. And this king is actually really snug on h1. Black wound up bringing the queen over to try to get some sort of counterplay on the king side. But this is already the sign of things going wrong. Black needed to liquidate to the end game after knight to g6, and a whole bunch of pieces would have come off the board, probably resulting in some sort of equality. That being said, after queen to g6, Shabalov continued with the dynamic play, playing rook to e3, the idea of having a rook lift over to g3, activating this rook and putting further pressure on the king side. His opponent played queen to h5, and after king to g1, Black aired with knight to g6, but he had to make a really uncomfortable decision here, which was to have played bishop takes e4, giving up the bishop pair. This is actually a really unnatural move because now there's no natural defender of all these light squares and white has an extra attacker. I think if Shabalov had gotten this position, he would have probably been able to convert. This rook is coming to g3. These pieces are perfect on the f file. This rook is misplaced and now this bishop on f8, you know, yes, it is protecting g7, but it's going to make things awkward for this e8 rook. But black played knight to g6 and immediately white actually has a winning position after this move knight to g3. Black aired and actually hung his queen and allowed this position to occur and wound up resigning here. 
But even if he were to move his queen to the only safe square, by the way, queen to h4, he'll quickly find that he's dropping a piece. Rook takes e8, rook takes e8, bishop takes b7, and then if black tries to play knight takes f4, they're going to reach this endgame where it's a very clear conversion for white, just simply up a piece. Um, there's not even extra pawns for black's favor. These pawns will quickly become serious weaknesses, and black's just simply down a piece and will go on to lose the game. So this is a really nice idea by Shabalov. I really liked how, you know, this, despite how scary it may seem to play a move like g4 and weaken, you know, potentially weaken your king, it really quite played out quite nicely. After g5, the game definitely shifted, and this was a huge moment for Shabalov in this game. So this was a really nice play by him. So this was a nice win by Shabalov, probably our nicest game of the night. Um, probably one of only a few highlights. We had a couple of other interesting wins, but those were a lot more back and forth games and a lot less clear cut. So I thought this would be, you know, something enjoyable for you guys. But let's talk about our matchup next week with the Webster Windmills. Um, what can I say? As I mentioned earlier, you know, I think Webster lost only their first game of the season, but since it's played phenomenally, I think they're probably one of the best teams in the Pro Chess League right now. Um, so we're really lucky to play them. Uh, you know, based on how our previous matches goes, you know, I, I'm willing to bet a lot of pundits are going to, make a real uh, a lot of really scary predictions for us you know i'm expecting to see you know pundits all going to webster that's fine um this is actually you know for me personally this is not my first matchup with webster you know being a player for the university of pittsburgh um i've actually gotten the opportunity to play against three different webster teams at the pan american championships so i'm a little bit familiar with how this matchup goes it's really scary i think the first couple times but you know once you know if we can land that blow you know if we can get a really you know a really impressive score you know, things will actually turn out quite nicely for us. You know, if we can if we can get on the board early, you know, I think I'll give our, our players a lot of momentum going forward. You know, if I think back to our previous Pan Ams, um, we lost to Webster A three and a half to half, uh, which was, you know, seems like a blowout, but I think our team didn't really believe that we had the ability to pull that out. But in the last game, the draw that game, actually we had a 2200 draw Ray Robson. And so when we went into our next big matchup, which is against the University of Texas at Dallas B, with which had an average rating of about 2500, we only lost one and a half to two and a half, and we had a lot of great chances to win that game, just because a lot of us believed that we had what it took to play against these GMs, um, just because of that one draw. So, you know, even though you know, I think rating wise we're going to be huge underdogs. I think you know if we can just get on the board early, get a lot of momentum building. Who knows? A lot of things can happen. You know, this is rapid after all. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it, and you know, I think you know it's going to be a really fun matchup next week. Our game is going to be at 9.10 as opposed to 9 Eastern time. So make sure to tune in. Hopefully that means we get a little bit more chess.com broadcast time. I've noticed that because we start a little bit earlier, because we're you know a little bit more to the east than the rest of the teams in our division, um, we never really get that coverage from chess.com. But I think you know by the fact that we're playing Webster and by the fact we're starting 10 minutes later, we should get a little bit more coverage for those of you guys watching on chess.com. So make sure to check that out. As always, make sure to tweet at us using the hashtag Nerves of Steel. That's going to be... As always, our big, you know, our, our, our big hashtag for the matchup. So, anyways, this is Isaac Steinkamp signing off. As always, I'll update you next week on our match with Webster and going forward. See you then.